jumping into week three, a week late. And what this is about is the physical side of the modeling. The previous lecture, I covered all the terminology, things with, such as foreign keys, et cetera, et cetera. And with that stuff, if you'd followed through with the PDFs I provided and read them, you'd actually have a pretty good idea what that stuff was. What I'm going to talk about today is the physical side of the database design. When you're talking about tables and the actual database columns and fields, and the first step we're going to talk about is it's the physical database itself. So, so far, everything you've learned about is conceptual. It's concepts. It's nebulous. This is more to the actual physical side of the deal where it actually gets created. Even though it's still inside of a computer and it looks like it's not actually doing anything, there is a physical aspect to it. It's different than a physical aspect of like building a house where you actually knock the wood together and you know, you've got a freestanding structure. However, when you do the physical design for a database, there are implications depending on what you're using. It, there's implications based on what server you're using, uh, what architecture you're on, what you know, languages you're using, stuff like that. And Normally when you do a physical database, the very first two things you have to decide is the name of the database. That comes as a shock. You've got to name it. And normally you want to stay away from stupid names. You also want to stay away from code names. They're where I worked, they went for a while where they went down the happy um, Norse god route. Everything had a Norse god name. Absolutely everything. It got to a point where nobody knew what anything was anymore. You know, got one server called Odin, another server called Freya, then we had another project, we had a project which was not anything to do with servers, had a god name, it was kind of ridiculous. Norse gods, you know, Viking gods, Freya, Odin, Thor, etc., etc., that. It was a little ridiculous. You want to make the name of your database fit the theme of what it is you're designing. If you're designing a subscription service, I don't know, what you, would you call your database? Maybe subscription service? Or if it's specific to a customer, maybe, you know, Uber subscription service. Take your pick. The other thing that normally you have to do when you design the database, the physical aspect of the database itself, is the encoding. Now, does anybody in here know what encoding means? Don't worry about it, come back. NVIDIA card. They all do it. Encoding. What is the encoding? Encoding is the character sets allowed in your database. There once was a time where the encoding meant SQL, ASCII. The ASCII character set. The ASCII character set included all the characters from one, not the letter one, number one, character number one, to our characters 128. Then they expanded it to 256. And then they started throwing other languages into the database that didn't work in that set. Cyrillic does not fit in that character set. Definitely Asian characters do not fit in that encoding set. So they've created new encoding sets. One's called UTF-8. It's the most popular one. And it's basically, uh, I don't remember what UTF-8 stands for, but I think it's Universal Text Format. And it's an 8-bit encoding format, and it'll hold almost pretty much every language on Earth inside of it. Um, a few other things that could be involved. Uh, the first one would be collation. Collation is the sort order. You know, did you ever send out a print job to a printer and it asks you, do you want to collate your print job? Does it, do you want it to be, pay, uh, you know, you're sending out 20 copies, do you want 20 page ones, 20 page twos, 20 page threes, or do you want to go 1 to 20, 1 to 20, 1 to 20? That's collation. For example, sorting. Alphabetically, it is not done the same in all languages. In some languages, you know, especially languages that don't have A to Z, obviously it's not going to sort A to Z. It's going to sort some other way. Uh, table space and schema. Not all database servers have a schema. Uh, Postgres does. It's a subdivision of the database. So you can take the database and break it down into smaller pieces. Uh, table space is actually, I'm just mentioning it on the way by, is actually a quite advanced topic. You can actually determine where certain parts of the database reside on the physical disks. So if you have a large RAID array, which I don't know if you've gotten there yet in your Computer Essentials class, but if you have a large RAID array, 
you can choose where to put it on the disks. The only thing that's important to you guys is the name of the database. And if you pick UTF-8 as your encoding, you're good to go. The next one is the physical table. So far we've talked about entities. You guys roughly know what an entity is. It's a thing. It's an event, it's a person, it's a location, it's something that you can describe using properties and the properties are known as attributes. Now, when you translate this entity into a, a table, because once you make it into a physical database, it's now a table, you need to know the name of the table. That comes as a shock. Are you seeing a pattern here? Everything has to have a name. It's a bit how a class in Java must have a name. You can't have anonymous classes in Java. I don't think so anyways. And other things you might include. The encoding of the table. Remember I talked about encoding of the database? Some servers allow you to swap the encoding of the table itself so you could have a table in UTF-8, another one in Cyrillic, another one in Latin 1. So you could have all these different encodings on each table. Postgres does not support encoding across tables. Different encodings across table. MySQL does and it's one of the few th cute things that it does that almost nobody else does. There's probably a reason why nobody else does it. That's what we were using. Um, Oracle supports encode, different encoding on different tables. It's really painful to make it happen. Microsoft SQL Server does not support it. So, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag of whether or not the encoding is supporting all the servers. Uh, constraints, these are rules. I'll be talking about those in a few minutes. Indexes, uh, indexes comes later in the term, what those actually are. And triggers, that's the last thing I talk about in this term. But when you design a physical table, these are some of the things that are included. This is the one that's actually most important to you guys. Table columns and fields. You'll hear me use the word column, or you'll hear me use the word field. They mean the exact same thing. They're just alternative terminology. Now, when we talked about entities, the entities have attributes. Attributes become columns. So when you're doing the conceptual diagramming, you got entities and attributes. Physical, you got a table with, with columns or fields. Now, when you go to create your first column, there's a couple of things you need to have. The first one is a name. Remember I said there's a pattern here? Everything must have a name. Again, you'd use a logical name for your fields. Why? So that the developers don't come and hunt you down. They will hit you. I once had to deal with a database where the columns were called A1, A2, A3, A4. Why? Because the guy was a jackass. He had a little booklet that explained what each of the fields were. And then when he left the company, he took the book with him for employment security for contract purposes. Yeah. That was before pe company, well, that's when companies still trusted their employees. And they did sue the shit out of them for uh, theft. Yeah, well, no, it wasn't a textual property. It was theft because he stole time away from them. N namely, two and a half months of my time. Well, I figured out what everything was because he wouldn't answer his phone. We don't know why he left. He just left one day angry. The other thing you need to name, so if you're going to name a column, name it something intelligent. Like, if you're dealing with a person's name, I don't know, call it name. If you're going to deal with a postal code, call it, like, postal code. Name it after what it actually is. Don't, you know, don't call it fluffy. Why is it called fluffy? I don't know. I just felt like it was a fluffy day. It's a great way to have someone beat you down. Another thing you might, you need to do when you create a table, I mean a column, is define the data type. I'll be talking about those data, the data types in a few minutes, but you need to talk about data types. And when you define the data type, it's going to be, um, you know, was it a character, is it numbers, is it a date, is it something else? And different database servers have different data types available. They don't all call them the same thing, but they all roughly have the same basic subset. And I'll point out what those are in a few minutes, what the basic subset of the data types that are global. The other few items you should investigate is whether or not the column values are required. 
In other words, you may have looked when you were doing some of these labs when there was a column called null or not null. Remember the checkbox for not null? When you make a column not null, that means the value is required. If you make it null, that means you can put in no value. It's just literally a, a, a modifier called not null. Um, and you can also define a default value. So for example, if you create a column that's a Boolean, do you guys know what a Boolean is? Okay, good. I've actually tasked that in the past and people were not sure. Boolean means yes, no, true, false. So if you say a Boolean column must have a value, you should definitely give it a default value in case it doesn't get supplied. Therefore, is it true or false? Therefore, it could be a Boolean column that is required that defaults to false. These are considerations of when you define physical tables. Lab 4 was you guys playing with physical tables. So was Lab 2. Right? Lab 4 is basically Lab 2 plus Lab 3. Now, those are the basic pieces that you needed. However, when you start actually doing physical design, there's a few steps you have to in that are involved. The first one is where do you start doing the physical design? And this also involves the conceptual stuff, but the two main starting points that you'll have with any kind of physical design and or conceptual design is the starting point. The first one is you've been hired to re-implement something. There's a phrase in the industry called reverse engineering. It's very frowned upon. You're not supposed to reverse engineer. You're allowed to re-implement. Reverse engineer means you've, you've seen proprietary code and you're rewriting it. Re-implement means you're looking at the input and the outputs and making it happen. Now, when you're working from an existing system or existing documents, it's actually quite easy to work with because you have concrete concepts. In other words, they gave you an invoice. This is the data they output. Congratulations. They have order forms. This is the, uh, the data they expect to have come in. You know exactly the pieces you're working with. There's no mysteries, except for something called legacy. Now, not the game. Legacy, it means cruft. Crap that's been accumulated by a company over the years. Old computer systems. For example, here at the school, legacy is equal to access. It's ancient. It dates back to the 70s and 80s. It's there. There are things that it requires that they don't need anymore, but they still need to put it in because the system wants it, because that's how it's written. That's one of the problems when you come from an existing system. Sometimes even with the paper-based stuff, there's legacy. Its name is usually Bob. Bob does not want to change how he does things. He's got certain things he writes on every order form that everybody else ignores. That's also legacy. As part of that design process, you have to start learning about what to ignore. What is not important, it's part of talking to people. On the other, on the flip side of the existing system side of it, it's called the clean room implementation. Now, personally I prefer clean room, but I've been doing this for long enough that I, you know, I prefer clean room because I don't have to deal with the cruft. But there's a couple of risks with it. One, it's a lot easier to make a mistake or to leave something out. Why? Because you have no examples. And you end up having to talk to people a lot more. If you don't feel very social, it could be a problem, right? If you don't like to, if you hate people, it could be a problem if you don't want to talk to them. So you end up having to interview all the stakeholders. You end up doing brainstorming sessions, often with people that had no idea of what you're actually doing for a living. Sometimes you have to do research, look at competitors' products, uh, existing systems that do similar things. Maybe you can find something that works pretty much like what they want with a bit of tweaking. Um, but the problem with the clean room, the biggest one, is that it's easy to miss something. So as you talk to all the stakeholders, and because all of them know something, and there's a certain process that everybody in the building knows, and they think it is so obvious, because everybody knows it's there, but nobody ever wrote it down. Anybody ever have that experience at, a at one of their jobs? Where there's a certain process when somebody comes in that, you know, every time somebody comes in, they hit a certain button on the door? 
every time they come in. You know, nobody tells you why you have to hit that button on the way in, but that button has to be hit on the way in. Because it resets the door lock. And nobody can get in behind you if you don't hit that button. And it's a fire door. Surprise. Um, things, stupid things like that. That's called legacy that everybody knows it needs to be there, but no, it's never been explained to you why this stuff has to be there. So the clean room stuff, that's the biggest risk. All right. So that's, you know, when you're thinking about the physical aspect of things, those are where you go and collect your bits and pieces, and you've got to take that stuff into account. That will affect your decision-making, especially with the data types. And when you're picking data types, you have to take certain things into consideration. Now, the very first consideration, which is the most important, which comes from either legacy information or interviews, is how big is the data? I don't mean as in how many millions of records are there. I'm talking what is, for example, what is the longest name you expect to type into the system? How long is a part number? What is the biggest quantity we think of we'd sell of a given item? That's size of data. You know, I've had students with horrendously long names. Like, like stupidly long names. Especially if they came from Puerto Rico. I don't know why, but they liked really, really long names in Puerto Rico. You know, this one fellow had like six first names. It was fantastic. He'd actually answered every single one of them. It became a game. You know, he's got a huge first name, but maybe that's just an outlier. So you've got to figure out the largest of your data. Is it numeric? So in other words, is it just numbers? Because if it's just numbers, you're not going to use a data type that allows characters. For example, a quantity. Quantity Q. The letter Q. No, that's not a quantity. That's a letter. 5 is a quantity. 3.2 is a quantity if we're working with weights. Therefore, when you talk about numbers, are there decimal places? Yes or no? How much precision of decimal places do you need? For example, if you're selling bananas, and you're not selling bananas by the weight, you're selling bananas by the banana. One banana, two bananas, three bananas. And you're not allowed to ever cut the banana in half. Therefore, what kind of number would you use? An integer, because it's a whole number. On the other hand, we're going to sell bananas at 57 cents a pound. Therefore, at this point, it, you could be selling 1.62 pounds. Therefore, you need a decimal place or two. You have to decide how many decimal places you need. For weights, often for the stores, they'll go to three decimal places. For money, how many decimal places do you think you need for money? Three. You display two. You store three. It's for rounding. Um, accountants actually track money to three decimal places in their accounting systems. They get displayed at two, but they have the choice of seeing it at three. Uh, for example, where I work, we sell everything in U.S. dollars. Every day, the accountant at the start of the day opens up the books for the day, and he types in today's exchange rate that he's going to use. And it's always three to four decimal places for the exchange rate. Why? You know, that last little digit makes a big difference when it start, everything starts rounding up. And, you know, considering it's all in U.S. dollars, we're happy when the Canadian dollar crashes. Therefore, the bigger that number is, the better it is. And the more decimal places we have, the more accurate the rounding is going to be for the end of the day. Um, other places you do use decimal places, it'd be scientific. So this actually affects what kind of numerics you'd use. I'll be talking about some of those in a bit. Now, if it's a date, and this is one where I tend to diverge with some of the other database profs. Some database profs say, oh, I'm going to store a date. So they're going to say, use a date field. Now, I've been working in industry as a database guy for 20 years-ish. 23 years. Let's go with 20, 22 years. That sounds about right. And the very most important thing I've ever learned is after six months, somebody says, what time did that happen? And you say, well, it's only a date, because you said you only wanted the date. Well, we, now we want the time. And if they'd asked that originally or told you that's how they'd want it, you would have planned it that way now instead of having to rewrite parts of an application. 
Now, the space constraints differences between a date and a date time is four bytes. Therefore, include the time. It takes up almost no room, and it gives you an insane amount of more precision. So for later on, when they want to start running, at, when you're a small company, they might say, well, where were our sales yesterday? Suddenly, the company has tripled in size, and they want to know what is the peak time of day where we have the most sales so we can make sure we have enough people on the floor. Places like Ikea, you know that there's not somebody sitting there guessing what the peak days are going to be and what the peak hours of the day are on any given day of the year. It's all metrics coming out of the computer, and they track everything down to the second. Therefore, when you include anything that has a date, just include the date time. Different database servers call that data type differently. Sometimes it's called date time, sometimes it's called a timestamp. But include the time at the same time because it takes up no extra room realistically and you have the precision if you ever need it. Uh, the next one is text. How big is the text? Now, in a database server, there's several text data types. There is the character type, which I'll be talking about in a bit, the variable character type, which I will also talk about a bit, and then there's the one called text, also known as memo. Or if you're working with Oracle, it's called a C blob. Actually, a C lob, a clob, character large object. That is just huge amounts of text. Now, depending on how much text you need, you've got to pick the appropriate type. Actually, one of the next slides actually shows the different data types, specifically to Postgres, but it'll give you an idea of what you actually work with. Uh, but the last one I have on the screen, on the list here, is blobs. And notice I say, just say no to blobs. The use case, the proper use case for blobs is almost non-existent. Blobs are binary large objects. Anybody want to take a guess what a binary large object actually is? It's a file. It's an image, an, an MP3, a movie, you know, a Photoshop file. It's binary data that is large, that is an object. It is everything. That doesn't mean you should show or store everything inside the database. Now, here's why you say no to blobs. There's actually a really good reason for it. Because there once was a time where people thought it was the greatest thing ever. I'm going to take my music library, I'm going to store every song in my database. Therefore, if I want to go find a song, I can go extract it by you know, running this command, I get the songs out. Sounds like a great plan, except how big is the average MP3? Let's go with six megs. How big is the average JPEG that comes out of a person's phone nowadays? Three to four megs. How big is the average Photoshop file? Anybody here play Photoshop? How big is an average, you know, 25 layer image? You know, minimum. That's for a small one. Yeah, exactly. So, now imagine that you have, well, go use with your 500 meg images, a million 500 meg images in your database. One million times 500 megs is how much data? You know, 500 terabytes, right? Considering you know, the more the average hard drive size is still you know under a terabyte. In all your laptops, anybody here have a more than a terabyte hard drive in their laptop? Probably one or two, maybe three or four. I'm, I'm, gonna get, I'm getting there. So, but now the problem is you've got a database that's occupying multiple terabytes. And you need to do a backup every night of your database because you should do backups. How long do you think it takes to back up two terabytes? I'm going to get to that in a second. A, a two terabyte backup can take hours and hours and hours, and you're moving the data from one server to another. It gets to the point where it's actually impacting daily business. So, and the other problem is what happens if your database shits the bed and your files get corrupted? You've lost data, and trust me, trying to rebuild a database full of blobs is almost impossible. I've inherited one, and it was bad. So what do you do instead of that? So what 
when you look at your computer and you look at all the files on your computer, what do all the files have in common? There's two things they all have in common. The first one is a path. The second one is a file name. All right, so we got a 500 meg image. And it's sitting on drive D under pictures, and it's called, you know, DCF 101 something 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 dot raw. At most, that file name plus its path is going to be 255 characters. That's 255 bytes. 255 bytes versus 500 megabytes. Do you know how many files you can store in the database by just storing their file names and their location as opposed to the actual physical file? You know, your database is going to go from terabytes down to megabytes instantly if you do that. And the backups are better because there are tools designed to back up disks. They do it really, really well. Yes, but with the disk system one, they usually do what they call a delta. It only looks at what's changed and backs up those changes. Maybe you're not putting a million 500 meg images there a night. You might be putting down five. So it only needs to back up those five images. That's where, you, when you write your software that interfaces with it, the software goes and grabs the file off the disk. You just provide the location and address. Okay. So, f this file, and then, well, if you've got software and you go, I want these to get a hold of this image, and you double click on it, and then it goes and sucks it down and you know, allows you to retrieve it, or it'll just open up a file folder somewhere, depending on what the software is supposed to do. I mean, it's all different, right? But, so you don't store blobs in the database. The only use case for blobs I've ever seen is when you need to store special characters. For example, you have a small text file and it's got escape characters in it. Escape characters are characters that aren't part of the alphabet. Um, these include um, carriage returns. And there's others that before that which are actually stop codes and stuff like that. Those are, that's part of the standard alphabet, believe it or not. There's characters before that. There's one called Bell. Believe it or not, there's a special character. If you type it in, your computer goes ding. Um, there, are, there are spots where you need some of those characters, and they need to store them in a file. Or you have a database that is designed to be handled in English, but every once in a while you'll end up with a Korean file being brought in or some Korean data being typed in. A blob field will allow you to put in the actual raw bytes of the character and not try to transcode it to a different character set. So if your database is set up as UTF-8 and suddenly you've been handed uh, traditional Chinese as opposed to simplified Chinese, they have an awful lot of characters in their alphabet. It's not even an alphabet, but they have an awful lot of characters in their written language. And it might not fit in UTF-8, but it would fit in UTF-16. If your whole database is UTF-8, where do you put it? Put it in a blob, because it's just going to store the raw bytes of what they typed in. That's the biggest use for binaries, binary fields. Um, but yeah, don't use blobs unless you absolutely have to. Now, I'm going to talk about specific data types. These are specific to Postgres, which is the database we all have installed on our computers, or you should have installed on your computer. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is text types. Now, the oldest one is called a car, also known as character. It's a fixed length string, and it occupies the defined length. This is the oldest data type in database. It's been around for over 40 years. It has not changed in how it behaves. And a lot of, and all database servers support it. There once was a time where there was an actual real value to it. Uh, especially when you talk about the old tape-to-tape -tape systems or the really old hard drives that had limited space. Because what happens if you say this field is six characters long? What it would store is the first, let's say you put in two letters, A, B. Well, it would actually put in four placeholders so it always occupies, you know, six spaces, like six characters on the disk all at all times. So the, ca the, ca the record length is exactly the same all the time. On the tape systems, that was important because it would move it the length of the six characters and read. 
Now, with our computers with spin disks or SSDs or even the M2 drives where the access is random, it makes no difference. And the biggest problem with the character ones is they all use up room. And nowadays, you know, then again, I'm talking about terabyte drives. What's, what's a 20 meg database on a terabyte drive? It's nothing. However, go back 30 years, and what's a 20, me 20 megabyte database on a 25 megabyte hard drive? Right? That proportion counted for a lot. So some pocket protectors came up with something called the Varkars, character varying. And what they came up the solution was, it's a variable length string. In other words, you can say it is 25 characters long maximum. It will only store 25 characters. However, if I put in AB, it will store, it'll take up two bytes plus a special character. There's a special character that it uses as an end of field and marker. So it'll occupy two bytes plus like three bits. Instead of occupying 25 or 40 or 50, it occupies this. And the database servers were optimized to actually be able to recognize the ends of fields and it would just skip. And it actually has special markers that tells it where the next one is and stuff like that. And in Postgres, they've gotten to the point, and this actually applies to Oracle also in Microsoft SQL Server, there is no performance difference between a character field and a Varkar field. Therefore, there is no reason to use character anymore. Just use a Varkar. It just takes up less room. And considering a lot of database servers are actually loading the contents of their database in memory and they're actually running off cache, if it's occupying six bytes of memory as opposed to two bytes plus a bit, a little bit, you know, that's still RAM that's being eaten up. And we don't have as much RAM as we have hard drive space. Yes, some of us have eight gigs, some people have 16 gigs, some people might have 32 gigs of RAM. But considering how much of a pig most operating systems are, you know, you start losing right off the top. Now the last one is text. Um, they hold a single character per defined length. So if you go car1, it'll hold one character. If you go var car1, it'll hold one character. If you say car25, it'll always be 25 characters regardless if you put anything in it or not. Var car25 will be at most 25, but if you put nothing in it, it occupies like three bits. No matter what, regardless, it will always occupy that much room. Yes. The length? You sh no, you're, you're supposed to define the length. Um, it does cause problems if you don't. So, uh, Postgres is kind of forgiving and it'll let you. If you define a Varkar without a length, it actually assumes maximum length for a Varkar, which is like 10,000 characters on Postgres. On MySQL, it's 255. All right, so that's the car and the VAR car. The last one is known as, t yes? Um, yeah. Traditional database designers would say use car uh, for the, what you should do is actually refer to the database server you're designing against and see what their best practice is. For example, Postgres says don't use car. You say use varcar for everything, it's exactly the same. It, for them, actually, they treat cars as varcars. Padded varcars. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, and then Postgres said a car is obsolete. No, it's, it's string. So a varcar is the equivalent of a string in Java. So the last one is text, because this is all strings in Java, right? Whether it's a short string or a big string, it's all a string. In databases, it wants you to be a bit more precise. Why? Because it makes it more accurate. The last data type is text. And most SQL servers, database servers, so servers that support SQL have a data type called text. Except for Microsoft SQL Server, theirs is called memo. It is a large blob of text, as much text as you can jam into there. Uh, Postgres's is insanely large. Um, you can fit an entire encyclopedia in a single field. 
Uh, last time I double checked, I think it was four gigabytes of text per field. You're basically limited by your hard drive. It's, you'd be dumb to do that, to store that much text in there. It doesn't have a set length, but it has it. Now, MySQL has three because MySQL is special. They've got short text, text, long text. And I discovered that short text is 256K of text, medium, uh, regular text, if I remember, it's uh, about a meg, and then large, long text is the big one. If you have to really know what you're planning with MySQL. All right, data types number two, part two. Numbers. Now, in Postgres, there's three sizes, and these apply to almost all database servers. There's two, four, and eight bytes. An eight byte one is also known as a big integer. It can hold the range, and that's just because it's wrapping kind of funny. That's supposed to be negative nine, whatever the heck that number is, to its equivalent on the other side. It's a very big number. Um, decimal, decimal or numerics, they're the same thing. It allows you to have 131,072 digits before the decimal place and 16,000 and change decimal places after the decimal after the period. It's very precise. Yes? No, it actually do an integer overflow. Um, if you don't know what that is, go look it up. But I mean, dude, if you've got a number bigger than that, you're working with numbers that are, you'll want the next, the next data type down there called the real or the double precision. Because that of those allows expo a lot of exponent values to be put in. Yes. Well, it takes up a. It, well, technically, the zero occupies a space, and that's why. The zero is not a real thing, but it's a real thing, right? So, if you need a lot of precision, or you need a really huge number, you can use either a real or double precision. That's the equivalent of what you guys are using as floats. In Java. Um, then there's serial and big serial. Now these, that data type is specific to Postgres. It's what they call a meta type. And the latest version of Postgres is deprecating them because they've brought out the, the industry standard version of doing this exact same thing. Um, basically put what serial or big serial is, it's a four and an eight byte integer with a bit of magic sauce thrown in to do auto increment, to count automatically one, two, three, four, five. What do you use these for? Primary keys. Remember I talked about synthetic keys two weeks ago? Or surrogate keys? I talked about those two weeks ago. And yes, I know I talked about them, because that much I do remember. And I said, you know, just let the database take care of the numbers in those, because it has no real world meaning, so it's actually really safe. Postgres provides the serial types to do that. The last one is money. And the money type allows for two decimal places, but it does the rounding to more than two decimal places down. It handles the rounding slightly differently than a decimal would do the rounding. And as you can see, it's essentially an integer plus two decimal places. And, you know, if I had this much money, I wouldn't be teaching. If I had that much money, I'd be in jail. So, you know, the numbers don't work. You know, they're, they're, they're really meant for financial applications. Now, earlier I was talking about time and timestamps. And in Postgres, a date time field is known as a timestamp. In MySQL, it's known as date time. In SQL Server, it's called date time. In Oracle, I honestly don't remember. Um, Postgres allows you to also store the time zone. So you can actually set what time zone that timestamp was put in. So here it'd be minus four or minus five, depending on the time of year. And it occupies eight bytes. So, you know, that's not a lot of space to hold an entire timestamp. And it's accurate from going to 41,013 BC to whatever the heck that number is. 294,000, 276 AD. And it tracks it in microseconds. Uh, this is why Postgres is really popular in the scientific field. 
its time tracking is by far one of the most accurate. So when you start playing with the database, in the S when we start doing SQL, you'll notice some of the timestamps will have dot and then decimal places. That's, you know, hundredth of a second, thousandth of a second. That's the precision, down to the microsecond. Um, you can store time without the time zone. You can actually just store time, 3 p.m. There you go. That's a time. It occupies 12 bytes. Do you notice it occupies more room than a timestamp? It is what it is. It's just how it needs to store the time. It's weird. Um, again, microseconds of precision. Uh, date, I skipped that one. It's a four bytes. And the, the, the date goes from, again, 40, uh, 4713 BC. But if you don't include the time, it goes to whatever the heck that number is, 5 million AD. If you're still using this version of Postgres in 5 million AD, we either they did something really, really right or, you know, something's gone horribly wrong. The vault just got unlocked or something. There you go. Remember earlier I was talking, if you have to do anything with dates and times, just use timestamps because it gives you all the precision you'd ever need. Unless, of course, you're actually needing to go past, you know, 292,000 years in the future or before 47,000 years in the past. Actually, technically, that's 6,000 years in the past, right? 47,000 BC plus 2,000 AD. So if you need to track your data for 6,000 years prior, yeah, you're probably going to use some other kind of data types. One of the cool features Postgres has is the ability to store intervals. The, an interval is how long did something take? It's irrelevant of when it actually started or when it actually ended. How long did it take? So for example, when people go to uh, track and field, they don't track when the person started running or when the person stopped running, they track how long did it take them to run the quarter mile? Right, 100 meter dash. They don't care the, mic the very second they started, they want to know how long it took them to cross that finish line. The rest of the data is totally irrelevant. So this allows you to do intervals, which is so you can store an elapsed amount of time. And as you can see, it'll store, how many zeros is that? Okay, 178 million years in microseconds of precision in both directions. So you can say, okay, well, we started doing this date, and then they spent, you know, 178 million years surfing Reddit. So those are all the major data types. Those are those are the types you'll find almost anywhere. Um, there are some that are specific to Postgres that don't exist anywhere else. Geometry types. Uh, if you want the geometry types in Oracle, it'll cost you an extra 50 grand. Uh, Postgres gives them for you for free. That means you can actually store geometric primitives in it. You want to store a circle in a database. You literally type in x, y radius. And then you can actually tell, give, you can actually search for any circle that's smaller than a certain radius. Uh, you can store in MAC addresses. You can store in network addresses. IPv6 addresses can be stored natively and you can actually query them. Um, just Postgres has, uh, last time I checked, something like close to 70 different data types. That was the sampling that, that are used 99% of the time. Okay, field design part one. Rule number one, make your names meaningful. I already talked about, yes. Yep. Pardon? For field names? I think I already covered the naming conventions I want used. It depends on the database server when you deal with your field names. Uh, that which is the second one there is the naming conventions. For example, Postgres is very picky about mixed case. I'm sure you've had the experience in Java already where you whoops mixed case to one of your variable names and then you didn't type it in the same way a second time and then it's complaining that you know you introduced a logic bug because your variables aren't defined properly. Postgres cares a lot about the field names. It cares if they're uppercase or not. Microsoft SQL Server sometimes does. MySQL does not care at all. No, there's no set rule. Depends on the database server. However, if you make everything lowercase, it's going to work everywhere. Without anything weird. 
having to be done to make it work. All right, so make your field names meaningful. Give it a real meaning. I already described why you should make it meaningful earlier. Don't call it A1. I'll be mad. Because if you had me a data, uh, an assignment that the fields are called A1, A2, and A3, I'll take out my past frustrations on you. You have to decide on your naming conventions and then stick through it throughout the design and even during post-design implementations where you're, you know, you're going back and adding stuff. Follow the same naming convention for the entire database. If you have another database and the naming conventions are different, that's fine as long as you stay consistent. Now, you try to make a guess at, at the maximum size of the data will be, and you try to make it as informed as you can. Sometimes you don't have all the story and you make a mistake, that's life. A good rule of thumb I tend to use is how big do I think it's going to be, then I add 10%. Unless I'm dealing with the government of Ontario, then I add 20%. No, you think I'm kidding, I'm not. Because they're always wrong. So, just take how much you think you're going to need. So let's say you think the biggest name we're going to have is 20 characters. Give it an extra two or three. Or just bring it up to 25 just to give yourself some extra space. Just be on the safe side. If you're using VAR cars, it doesn't take up any extra room anyways. Don't make everything VAR car 50 because then you're kind of muddying the, read, the meaning of the length of the data. Canadian postal codes are not 50 characters long. American postal codes can be up to 10 characters long. It is what it is. Um, and you name your relations in an appropriate manner. So if you're creating foreign keys, you give them an appropriate name. Now, field design part two. As he asked me if it was okay to have mixed case, I've recommended you keep everything lowercase. Why? Because at least you know it's going to work everywhere without any magic sauce applied to your code. Do not ever use ever spaces in anything. Just because Microsoft SQL Server and MySQL allow you to do it doesn't mean it's a good idea. And because Mac lets you do it, it means it's a terrible idea. Don't ever put spaces and stuff because you end up having to use weird syntax that is not universal to access your field names. Why? Because the SQL language, which we'll be learning in a few weeks, uses space as its keyword delimiter. Select space name space from space users. Instead, if you went select space first space name, and now it thinks, hey, I'm going to do a new command now. Boom, it blows up in your face. Now, if you're working with Postgres, you'd have to go select space quote mark first space name, close quote mark. In MySQL, you'd be using a back tick. Microsoft SQL Server, you'd be using square brackets. Do you see the pattern here where each database server does it differently? Therefore, don't use spaces. Use an underscore. If you want to space out your words, put an underscore instead of a space. It reads exactly the same, and you're not going to break anything. And the last rule is stick to basic data types whenever possible. Don't get fancy. Just because you started out on MySQL yesterday, and in three years from now, your business is booming, and MySQL is crying in the corner because it can't take the abuse it's now receiving. You now need to port it to a real database server, such as Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, or Postgres. And suddenly you got all these specialized data types that are specific to MySQL and you need to rewrite all your code. But if you stuck to standard data types, such as varchar, text, int, those are portable. They'll work anywhere. Therefore, stick to the basic data types. Sometimes you can't. If you're storing geospatial data, such as, you know, the geometry of a map, MySQL can't do that. Postgres can. Oracle can. I don't think Microsoft can. They have special data types to do it. They need special like add-ons to actually do geospatial. Um, unless you're doing something really specific like that, stick to the basic data types. All right. Now, back to talk about data types. As you notice, the, the highest portion of this class has been talking about data types because that's what databases is all about. Now, when you're mapping a data type to a field, earlier I already talked, how big does it need to be? 
Should I plan for slightly larger data? What is the answer to that question? Give yourself extra room. Is the data text numeric or date time of some sort? Does the number have decimal places? How much precision do I think I need? If you think you only need one, go to two. Why? You can't invent numbers. Therefore, you can always round, but you can't invent numbers that no longer exist. Because once it's stored and it's been rounded stored, it cannot be ever retrieved. Can the number be negative? Now, Postgres doesn't give you the choice of turning on positive or negative values. MySQL, you can create your integers as being unsigned, which means you can never put a negative value into it, which actually allows you to have one order of magnitude bigger number. So let's say the biggest number could have been 999,000. It suddenly becomes 9,999,000 because we're now giving up the space for the negative. The other question you can ask is, how big is this number going to be? You're going to use an integer? A big integer, a float or a real. Um, again, when you look at your date and times, do you need to store the date and the time? The answer is yes. Always. Store them both. There's no reason not to. All right. That was that one. Now, if anybody needs to go take a quick bathroom break while I move on to the next topic, you got five minutes. Hold on. I just want to hit the stop button on this so that uh, I shoot wrong slideshow. This one. Okay. Here we go with the rest. I'm going to do about half of this. Yo. Thank you. I'm going to do about half of this slideshow because I want to talk about the assignment and the test that's supposedly due next week, which I am adjusting the due date on, kind of, but not quite. You'll see why when I explain what I'm doing. And what I'm going to do, since next week I was planning for this to be a work period, I'm going to finish the slideshow at the start of the work period. So I'm going to get through the first, you know, five or s well, maybe the first eight slides or so, and then I'll do it next week. So that should take about a half hour, because I want to give myself a half hour at the end of this class. And worst comes to worst, if you don't want to come for that, it's okay, I'll record it anyways, so. Okay, normalization. Normalization is the suckiest topic to teach. I hate teaching normalization. It's a pain in the ass to explain. And I'm, I'm being completely honest when I say that. I'm not even going to pretend I hate teaching it. Um, but it's an important concept to know. Uh, the reason I don't like teaching it is that a lot of people have a hard time grasping it. And I don't mean it's because I'm not explaining it right. It's just it's one of those things that either you get it or you don't. And if you don't get it, then you have to work at it for a long time until it clicks. And I have a t-shirt at home where, you know, it says, I can explain it, but I can't understand it for you. That is literally what it applies to the normalization. Okay. Data normalization is a process. It's a tool. And the purpose of it is to validate and prove the logical design so that it follows certain rules of design. Like, same thing, when you build a house... There's a building code you have to follow. It says you build it such such a way, otherwise you could have a fire, or the roof might fall on your head, or the house may shift and collapse. In database, the most important goal is to avoid duplication of data. You don't want to put the same thing in two different places. Why? That means you need to maintain it in two different places. I can't even I can't, I can't even come up with a real world example of of this really off the top of my head. I guess a close example of that would be imagine you had um, anybody here remember the old checkbooks? You know, you'd write a check and you write out in the checkbook that you wrote yourself a check. And then at the end of the month you'd balance your checkbook to make sure that you know you didn't spend more than what was in your account. Oh yeah. This is old school before you could go whip out your phone and go the only BM go, oh shit, I'm in the negative. Right? Back in the day, you actually had to keep track of your spending. 
Otherwise, you had to go to the bank and they charged you a buck to update your bank book. And now imagine if you had two checkbooks, and every single time you wrote a check, you had to write it down in two different places. And one day you forget to write it in the second place. Then you're screwed, because now your books don't match up. Normalization is the process of making sure you don't duplicate data in that database. And in the end, it should produce well-structured relations. In other words, your your, all your database tables and all your objects and all your relationships between them should be structured in a sane manner. Now, a well-structured relation is a structure, it's a data table or an entity or what they call also a relation because this word means the same thing in all these different places, that contains minimal data redundancy and allows a user to insert, update, or delete data without causing inconsistencies. Now, for example, an insertion anomaly, when you add something to the database, and to add something to the database, you have to duplicate something. So, you work for a medical office, and every single time you add a new patient, you have to retype in the, all of the doctor's information. That's kind of dumb, isn't it? Why would you want to do that? Especially if uh, you suck at typing and get the doctor's name wrong every once in a while. Deletion anomaly. You delete a patient. Well, you delete the patient. You also nuke the doctor. Oh, well, I guess that person's not working for us anymore. That's deletion anomalies. Modification anomalies. That one's actually fairly easy. Now, when people get married, one of the two people often takes the other person's last name or at least hyphenates the other person's last name. I've seen it go both ways with either sex. So I've seen men get, take the woman's name and some women take the man's name. So I'm being gender neutral on this one. PC. I'm, I'm being really PC by pointing out I'm being PC. But let's just say you have a database and person A's last name is in the system in six different places. And they got married and they're changing their last name you'd have to go in and change their name in six different places. Now, you could write an automated routine that goes through and updates all six spots. However, what happens if halfway through the update, something goes wrong? And only three of the six places gets updated. Now, this person now has two different last names. They've now become two different people. How do you know which one's the right one? Well, obviously, you have the paper in front of you telling you it changed, but say two months from now, you didn't realize something went wrong, and you go look this person up, and there's only three entries. That's called a modification anomaly. If you have to modify data in more than one place, that's bad. Because things happen. And you don't want things to happen. So if you get rid of redundancies, in other words, you store the person's name in only one place, and you refer to that from everywhere else, you update the person's name in one place, and everything gets the update. OK. Now, uh, here's a little slide. It's really hard to read on this screen. I wonder if my, did my daughter leak, take my laser pointer? No. Just to save myself from walking back and forth and pointing at the screen. Now, yes, it's blue. Now, in here, there's an insertion, what they call an insertion anomaly. So you can't add a new employee without having the person take a class. So here's an employee with their name, and there's the course title. You can't add someone unless you include the course title. Why? Because Lorenzo Davis doesn't have a course. That means nobody else is not allowed to have a course. Because the combination of the employee ID and the name plus the course title makes the record unique. Therefore, you cannot add unless you give them a course. So imagine you just hired a new employee and they have never taken a course yet. Well, you can't put them into the system because they haven't taken a course. So how do you put them in the system? chicken before the egg. So you'd end up having to give everybody a generic introductory course to make sure you can put them in, which is really dumb. Deletion. So if we go and we nuke employee number 140 right here, Alan. Alan was embezzling because he worked in accounting. And we fire him and get rid of him. We would lose this course because that whole row would get deleted. The whole thing goes away. And if we delete Alan, we lose the fact that we actually had an accounting department and that he took a course called tax accounting. That's called the deletion anomaly. When you delete one piece of information and it takes 
other important information along for it for the ride. Can you imagine? You fire your accountant, now you don't have an accounting department? Holy cow, we don't have to worry about the money anymore. Yeah, that's not how that works. But, you know, now, modification anomaly. I already described that one a little bit. If you look at employee 100, if we update her salary here, and then the system craps out, and this, this one goes to, say, 52000 this one stays at 48000 and the system craps out, what's their correct salary? Most accounting, most payroll systems will grab the last value in the database. That means if the first one's 52000 and the second one is 48000 she's going to get paid 48000 not 52000 That's like known as a modification anomaly. So when you do normalization, there's a series of steps that you take. You start out with a table that is really bad. Multi-valued attributes with dependencies and all kinds of stuff in it. The very first step to become what's called first normal form is to get rid of the multi-valued attributes. I'll be ex de demonstrating that in a second. And then you get rid of partial dependencies. That brings you to third normal, the second normal form. Get rid of the transitives. That brings you to the third. Now, this right here, there's a reason why I have this split on two slides. Right here is what's considered to be a properly normalized database, third normal form. That is the usual target. That's what you want to aim for, is third normal form. If you go past third, there's something called Boyce COD. And it, Boyce COD, I talk about shortly, that towards the end. Um, and Boyce COD is known as normal form three and a half. Informally, it's not its formal, it's not its real name, it's just in the history, we call it normal form three and a half. It just takes care of some edge cases. And then there's fourth, fifth, and actually there's a sixth and a seventh, and then some other weird ones past that. These ones here is pretty much used in academia. This stuff almost never happens in the wild. So if you design your stuff to third normal form, it's good enough. Because 99% of the time, if you're in third, you've matched up Boyce Cod, and you're probably fourth and fifth included. It's unless you have really odd data. All right. Now, some terminology before I start. Functional dependency. A functional dependency is the value of one attribute determines the value of another attribute. It sounds kind of, of an odd case when it's just said like this. But if, a, if one field determines the value of another field, in other words, if you have an employee ID, the person's name is dependent on the employee ID because that's how you'd find the employee's name is by employee ID. So the employee ID determines the employee name. And that's a functional dependency. In other words, the name is functionally dependent on the, uh, the employee ID. The, the employee's start date is dependent on that. Maybe the employee's department is dependent on that. Maybe the employee has more than one department. Who knows what their structure is like? Um, the next important word is a candidate key. Now, we talked about primary keys two weeks ago. These are the keys that let you identify a role uniquely. A candidate key is a unique identifier. One of the candidate keys will probably become the primary key unless you use a surrogate key, which, honestly, you should use anyways. And each non-key field has to be functionally dependent on it. In other words, if you have a field that determines the value of another, so you have an order ID, a customer ID, the order has a date, the customer has a name. Is the customer's name dependent on the order ID? No, it's only dependent on the customer ID. Therefore, that field is not dependent on the whole primary key. It's only dependent on part of the primary key. So that's a little, that's, you know, the non-key field must be functionally dependent on every candidate key. So if you have multiple candidate keys, every field left in that structure has to be dependent on it. That's just pure terminology. All right. So, because I'm going to get to the end of the first normal form today. That's where, I'm, that's where I'm trying to get to. An invoice. This is going to be used for the rest of this set of slides, which will be continued next week. Currently, this is not a valid relation. Can somebody tell me why it's not a valid relation? So it's not a valid table structure. It, 
Yes. The way this is set up is that this right here, all this belongs to that order ID. However, these ones are missing part of the data. That's totally it. Same thing down here. This, it's missing part of itself. So it's not complete. So this is not even in first normal form. This is basically an unnormalized data set. Often, this would be a report, right? It would be printed out. It would look like this. And then somebody says, we need to work with this kind of data. And visually, we can identify that all this stuff belongs to that order. Computers are dumb. They really are. They don't know any better. So as far as they're concerned, product 5, product 4, and then again, product 4 here, they're not attached to any orders in this structure. How would you fix it? Stuff all the way down. So that each of these items here are complete rows of data. That means at least you can use, and if you look here, the, the prime, the candidate keys are defined as product ID and order ID, and the combination is there for every row. Yeah. Well, when it's properly normalized, you wouldn't do that either. This is to get it to the first normal form. We're aiming for third. The first normal form means that each record is complete onto itself, and there's no multi-valued attributes, which I'll explain in a second what that is. Yes. Yeah, you can have the as long you can have the same order ID as long as you got multiple product IDs. In this case, they have to, yes. So you can have multiple order IDs as long as there's multiple product IDs. You cannot have two identical rows that have candidate keys. Which this is the candidate key here and here. The order ID and the product ID is the candidate key. That means that the the combination of the two must be unique per. Set, yes. Yeah, you had, that was that both questions? No, that's just a result of the output. Uh, when this is all done, you'll see how it's all broken down. Uh, but essentially, what time is it? Actually, I might have time to do the second normal form. So the key thing uh, to take away from this, though, is the two items. There's no multi-valued attributes. That means there are no columns that have more than one value inside of it. So an example of a multi-valued attribute would be uh, actual fact. Currently, going back to the previous slide, this here, this is considered a multi-valued attribute because it's multiple values attached to only one value. So to bring it to the first normal form, we want to break this down so that it's complete. Uh, another example would be a list of skills a person has. If you had, you know, PHP comma SQL comma C sharp comma, I don't know, something else, that's a multi-valued attribute because there's multiple values inside that one field. You need to break it down to separate items. Uh, the other item that's to take away from this is that every attribute is supposed to be atomic. In other words, it's totally each value of each column is totally self-contained. In other words, there's not more than one value in each column. For example, you have one date and only one date, not two dates inside that one column. So now at this point, this is technically first normal form. It's still crap. I'll, I'll call it completely honestly. It's total garbage still. However, you would now be able to retrieve data out of that database. By providing the order ID and the product ID, you'd be able to pull records out of that database. All right. Issues with that first normal form example. If a new product is for order 1007, the customer data must be re-entered. So if I go back here and look at order 1007, down here, if we add another item, we have to duplicate all the customer information which you don't want to duplicate information. Now, if we went to order 1006 and got rid of the dining room table, this one right there, if you delete this row, 
you end up losing information considering the finish and the price. In other words, you delete the dining room table. We no longer know that the table was ever ash. We no longer know that the table sold for $800 because we lost the data. The rest of it would stay there, but this would be gone. So we'd lose that, that chunk of data. Yes? Yeah, it would be gone in this case. If that was all the data we had in the database and we delete the dining room table, it's gone. We don't know that we ever offered a dining room table. We don't know it was ever offered in ASH. We, don't, we never know ever again that it was offered for $800. Yes? Yes? Vic, okay, so what happens if Fat Fingered Frank accidentally deletes that line? It's gone, right? If somebody accidentally deletes that row, the data is gone forever. We'll never know unless somebody goes and gets a paper copy and types it all back in. And all the timestamps are going to change because they're new, doing new data entry, so everything changes. Update. If we look at product ID number four, which is the entertainment center, if we need to update the price of the entertainment center, it's going on sale. 600 bucks instead of 650. We'd have to update it in two different places. That's an update anomaly. I've already covered that one multiple times. What time is it? Oh, do I have time? If we had another column? Color, yeah, well, depending if you'd suddenly said, well, this table's now offered in ash, but we're going to offer it in cherry instead, you'd have to go and update everything that has ash and replace it to cherry. But the other problem you have then is what happens for all the ones you sold in ash historically? Things get a little weird at that point. Okay. Uh, that actually, I'm at the halfway mark. Um, yeah, but I still got to talk about the assignment too. Um, and that takes about 20 minutes, so... Mm, no, I'm going to switch the assignment. Okay, so as long as you understand this, I'm going to pick up right from slide 10 next week. It should take me 20 minutes to finish it. Uh, at this point, I actually do need to talk about the assignment and the test, so... And I lost my browser. Hot damn. I love how fast Brightspace loads. It is like the fastest thing ever. <laughs> there, there's that, yeah. Okay, I'm going to start with the assignment. Oh, hold on. Okay. Now, you'll see assignment one shows up twice in here. There's one that's actually... Um, you can link to it because what happens is you can't see the second entry until, until you've created a group. Um, however, assignment one. Unfortunately, as part of the course requirements, you must have at least one group work. Not my choice because I hate group work. Why? Because I have to manage group work politics. And my partner didn't do anything. Well then. Tell me where this is my problem. My partner dropped out. Well, actually, that kind of is my problem now. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Or I don't want to work with people because of insert reason here. There's all kinds of valid reasons why you wouldn't want to work with people. Now, assignment one is a group work project, but I'm actually saying work in pairs. Why? Because there's not enough work for three people. I'm just calling it the way it is. So, the way this assignment works is I provide you with a... Wow, that's small. Let's make that bigger. Uh, you guys should actually be able to see this now under assignments. At least the, dis the, the description of the assignment. I provide you with some basic information about a database. You will 
design this database? It's fairly straightforward. It depends how far into the weeds you want to get. There is not a set number of tables. There's not a set number of anything. But there is a minimum that you'll ha need because you, gotta you can't lose data. So here is the theory uh, behind this. A school wants to move away from paper records. And they want to use to move on to computers. They sat down and did a consultancy with the developer, also known as you. And they had stakeholders in the room. And they all threw in their two cents worth. And they listed off everything they felt was important to them. Which sometimes may be completely irrelevant. Some of it may be stuff that never needs to be stored because it can be calculated. Things like GPAs, for example. You know your GPA is calculated, right? They, don't, they never store it in the system until right at the end just for performance reasons. So this has a series of items with descriptions of all the different data types. It really isn't that much. It's, it looks like a lot, but it really isn't that much because you're working with someone else. It takes a little bit of time to break it down to its component pieces. Now, you're, uh, you're going to design a third normal form database, which of course I haven't finished teaching you guys, because that's going to be finished next week. But you can at least start out on breaking down the pieces to its component, at least identifying the entities and the attributes, because that I have taught. And you will accommodate the data as described by the, all the teachers and the staff. And as it says on here, please keep in mind that the people who prepare the preceding outline know very little about database design. Therefore, the way they organized it may not be optimal. Your goal is to make it make sense. There's some stuff in here that makes absolutely no sense the way it's been given to you. I like this example because most of you have been gone through school. I'm hoping most of you have gone through school before coming here. Otherwise, I don't know how the heck you got in here. Now, there are concepts that are strange to certain student subsets. I've discovered that in certain cultures, disciplinary actions don't exist because students are never bad, supposedly. I've never heard of such a thing as a, as a not a bad student, but I once had an entire group where not a single person said they ever got a detention or a disciplinary action taken against them. And I was, my mind was blown. I couldn't understand. I didn't know if it was the truth or, you know, they were just shitting me. But, you know, that's what it is. So, what you're going to provide, the deliverables are as follows. In the end, you're going to give me a PG Modeler diagram. Export it as a PNG. I want the picture, not the DBM file. Why? Because I sit in my recliner with my iPad. And I grade. I can't open the DBM files on my iPad. I can open them up on a PNG. That's pretty fair. And this is how it's going to get graded. You get five points for the completeness of the design. In other words, did you not lose anything important that they asked you to include in your diagram? Five points about how well normalized it is. Obviously, I haven't finished that topic yet. So I'm going to be adjusting some due dates, just to be fair to everyone. Proper diagramming and structure. This really means, did you create relationships properly, and did you follow the naming conventions? And I'd already talked about the naming conventions, but I will repost them on Brightspace so there's no excuses. If any student in here, which I don't recognize anyone in here, has ever had me as an instructor in the past, or if you ever talk to someone that's had me as an instructor in the past, they'll tell you how notoriously savage I am when it comes to naming conventions. That is where, if people lose points, 80% of the people lost points because they didn't follow the set of rules I gave them. If nothing else, I will teach you people to be consistent. Because that's what I want is consistency. That is up to you to figure out. Yes, of course. I mean, can you have a test without a student? Can you have disciplinary action without a student? Hey, we're going to punish someone. The chair. This student, does he have... This student exists and he has no parents. It's past immaculate conception. He came from the void. 
That wasn't PC at all. But I'm just saying, those are examples, right? There are interdependencies. It's up to you to read it and think about it. And as you're using your experience at the receiving end of being a student, trying to understand how things are interrelated. I mean, obviously, you know what a class is. You know who teaches a class. You know who people who are taking classes. You know how tests work. You get a grade. Everybody takes the same test, but everybody else has a different grade. Things are interrelated, but there are differences in the data. Um, oh, I also give you guys one point for naming the file correctly. It's one free point. And I kid you not, I will take it away from 10 people in this room because you work as a group. That means five groups will do it wrong. So that's my, that's my average so far. And I laugh because I'll actually put it, go right at the first comment at the top and bolt. Ha, 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 you suck. Not quite, but, you know, yes. Give me a minute. Okay, that's task one. Task two, as I provide you with a DBM file. Your, the story is you had a junior developer. You told him to diagram something. He gave you a diagram, and then you threw up in your basket because it was so terribly done. It's like they didn't listen to their database prof at all while they went to school. It is a very simple diagram. There's three tables. However, you need to figure out what they're for. That's why you might want to talk to me while during the work periods to actually understand what they're for, unless you think you're smart enough to figure it out. Again, this one's five, five, and one. Is it normalized? Maybe you don't even need to normalize it. I don't know. It's up to you to figure that one out. Is it properly diagrammed? In other words, did you follow the naming conventions? Create the relationships properly. And, once again, one point for the right file name. Now, this is legacy from back in the Blackboard days before we rolled out to this wonderful product called Brightspace. <coughs> I'm trying to be positive, okay? With Blackboard, what would happen is I'd download everybody's assignments. It would put them all in one zip file. I'd extract it, and then I had three students with assignment one. You know how when you extract files, you know how that works? It keeps the last one. So I'd finish grading, suddenly I got four people with no assignment. Then I got to go hunt and spend 10 minutes trying to figure out who that was. You wasted my time. Brightspace actually is a little bit better than that, but I said, you know what, I'll keep it there just for shits and giggles and see what happens. And actually, if I had groups recently that would, one, get the first one right and get the second one wrong. Like it's two free points out of uh, 15, 20, 25, 27 points. I'm giving you two points out of 27 for free. Now, you asked, how does it get submitted? When you create a group, which of course I can't see how that's done on the teacher side because it doesn't look the same for me, you, the, the assignment allows you to create a group. And when you submit, it's a group file submission. Only one of you needs to submit it and you both get graded. Um, I had students last over the summer because I was one of the, the people that got to try it out over the summer. Uh, the group thing was a little challenging. Um, it's, it is under activities, groups, and obviously I can't do anything here. Um, I will be taking a quick shot at this because I'll try to figure out how it is again, and I'll send out a note tomorrow. Um, what I'm going to do for the assignment, I'm going to move it down. I'm going to move the due date down by about five days just to make it fair because I got to roll over to next week with the lecture material. And for the test, which was supposed to be due next week, obviously I didn't finish covering the material, so that's not fair. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to actually move the due date to the drop dead date. Normally what I have is I'll give you a, a week to do the test, and then if you're a week late past that, you lose a percentage, I'm just going to move everything to the drop dead date. So that means you'll have two weeks to do the test. It has released, or at least it should be visible now. So that means you can actually start doing the test until you hit questions you can't answer. And then you just stop until next week's lecture and then finish the test. Um, I, I'm personally, I think that's probably the most fair way I can try to meet people in the middle. Um, so for assignment one, 
I will take a look at see how you create the groups again because I'm it's I'm, it's dumb, but um, I'll probably sit with a student for a few minutes and see if I can get the group thing figured out, and then I'll send out a note. Uh, I still haven't updated the due date on the assignment, so it still looks like it's in two weeks from now, but it'll be like two and a half weeks from now. No. You can stop, save, and come back. Oh yeah, it's a take-home test, so obviously I can't watch whether or not you're using your open books. Oh, the only thing I ask is try to be a little bit honest, and don't sit with your friends and try to do it. Yeah, now I'm watching both of you now. <laughs> Good job. See, both got zeros already. No, I'm just saying is because I'm not sitting there watching you, it's tempting to sit there with three or four of your friends and try, you know, you all try to figure out the best answers. I'm asking, please don't do that. It takes away the value of a take-home test. It's my way of being fair for people that need extra time to take a test instead of having to do it in class and then end up going to somewhere else to write your test and you can't ask me questions. I'm letting you do it at home with open book with no time limit. Thank you. Nice try. Okay. So that's assignment one. I'm going to stop recording right now because I'm going to just try to see if I can figure out how the group thing works again. And if I can't figure it out, I'll, I'll send out a message tomorrow. There is an easy way for students to create the groups. I just remember what the heck it is. But you can't actually even see the official assignment until it's been created. Okay, I got two more questions. Which one was first? I'm going to go with the closest. Dude with the green on button. For the group? Well, that's the point of a group. You work together. Well, no, because you're going to sit together somewhere in a room and you're actually going to talk about the assignment. Or you can do the Discord thing if you want. I don't care. A little louder. I can't hear you. The lab is due when? No, the lab. I'm moving labs all down one week. So don't panic about lab four. I'm not going to punish anyone for it. Loud. It's not showing up yet? Give me a minute and I'll check. Two people per group. Can, can you just come here because I can't hear you? Too much noise now. <laughs> 